Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett. Welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I call this one, I was inside a UFO. Six strange true cases. As you probably know, I love all types of UFO encounters, whether they're simple sightings, landings, face-to-face -face encounters, but I especially love cases in which people are taken on board UFOs. I think these cases are the most interesting and I think they have the most information. They really have a lot to say about who these ETs are, where they're coming from, what their goals are on this planet, and so forth. So what I'd like to do is present six cases which come from all across the planet and stretch back decades, up, you know, several decades of time, and involve some really interesting and unusual elements. There are a lot of cases out there that are very similar, but I chose ones that I think have something unique to offer to our understanding of extraterrestrials and why they are picking people up. So these cases I think are super fascinating. I don't think they're very well known either. And what I also like about them is they have a wide variety of evidence. So we're talking in some of these cases medical evidence, uh, electromagnetic disturbances, animal reactions, physiological effects, and so forth. And frankly, they're just super interesting, really unusual. And the first case is probably one of the most unusual and fascinating cases I have ever heard. I don't know any other case quite like it. I call this one, the scene that I saw was horrible. And this is a somewhat controversial case, though researchers like Leonard Stringfield and Jim and Coral Lorenzen stand behind it. I don't think it's super well known, but it's so unusual and interesting that I think it deserves to be more well known, which is why I wanted to include it in this episode. This case took place in May of 1950. That's an approximate date. It was around there. And it took place in Bahia Blanca, Argentina. And yeah, as I said, this is one of the strangest onboard UFO encounters on record. But the main witness is quite credible. His name is Dr. Enrique Caratuno Bata. He was a physician, he's a professional architect, a former war pilot, and an aviation technician with a doctorate in aeronautical engineering. So a very intelligent guy. And it was in May of 1950 when he was in Bahia Blanca, Argentina and was driving along a remote dirt highway through a desert area some miles from his hotel in the town of General Acha when he saw what he describes as, quote, a silver object resting on the ground not far off the highway. So he was intrigued, being an aviation technician. He stopped his car and examined it and could see it was quite unusual. He walked up to it and approached to about 150 feet of this object. And he could now clearly see that it was a saucer-shaped object with portholes around the perimeter of a sort of tower or dome which was translucent and there was a door open and he could see this sort of reddish light pulsating at one second intervals in the interior and as Enrique says in his own words I stopped and I observed with attention the interior of the vehicle and I thought about the remainders of an airplane fallen but the strange form of the object caused me to abandon this idea. The clouds that passed, intercepting the sun, produced on the object a strange effect. So this thing was so shiny, it reflected the sky, it reflected the ground, and it reflected his own image, and shimmered kind of in the sun. And realizing how strange this was, he says that a boyish kind of excitement filled him. And when he saw that the door was open and he could see into the interior of the object, he became even more excited. But first he decided to take a little closer look around the outside of it. 
And now this is translated from a, another language, so the wording is a bit awkward, but I thought it was important to quote him directly. And as Enrique says in his own words, Before entering, I began to examine the object in detail. It had an approximate diameter of 10 meters, which is 30 feet, and was formed by two parts. A, do, a bowl in the shape of a plate, sort of a bell, and another up, a cylindrical tower, and covered by a dome. On the dome, a strange round flashlight. Its total height would be of some 4 meters, or 12 feet, and there was an extravagant color of chrome, of a polished magnificence, in which my image was reflected, and that of the sky. It seemed a dead thing, nothing of life, neither of noise, neither of vibrations. I sought the door that was open, and exactly to the foot of the tower. I realized that the object was not new, because the lower edge of the bell was a little deteriorated and was rough in some places. So what Enrique did was climb this little ladder that was coming up from the base and peered inside the doorway. And it was darker inside than outside, so it took a moment for his eyes to adjust, but he was absolutely shocked by what he saw. And as Enrique says, I smelled a strong smell of ozone and garlic. I jumped immediately to the interior. The spectacle that I saw was so strange that it surpassed the imagination. So he's walking inside, and the first thing he noticed was that the floor seemed to flex under his weight, and the walls themselves had sort of a rubbery texture that gave under his uh, pressure. They looked completely metallic, but clearly a weird kind of metal. He says the cabin of this craft was perfectly circular and contained a series of thick windows that reminded him of plexiglass. He also saw a series of vents in the floor. And again, I'll just let him describe in his own words what he saw. As Enrique says, My eyes were being accustomed to the lighting. The scene that I saw was horrible. In the center of the cabin, a strange seat was found occupied by a man of 1.2 meters to 1.4 meters of height. That's about four feet. Dressed with a combination of gray and lead, it had a round head with thin, clear hair and was inclined on its chest. The hands, well formed, were of a color of clear tobacco and they were supported nervously on two handles or levers on a black box. Its face was of the same color as its hands, the nose well formed, the lips without mustache, the cheeks without hairs. The eyes were large, very dilated and delicate. The forms were perfect, like an adolescent of 15 years, but with the characteristics of a man. It was not a dwarf. I touched an arm that was stiff, and the figure was cold. The feet were slightly supported on two pipes set to the floor, the clothes seemed to be done of hard leather and was inflated in the shoulders, giving the pilot the aspect of a player of rugby. The seat was of an adequate form to its body and of a color of red vermilion, and it was borne by a central axis. So he's saying that it basically spun around. And there was this little black box, he said, in front of the pilot, which looked like a panel with dials, much like a radio, there were strange symbols on it, like numbers, but clearly not numbers, and also what looked like a TV screen, which was active and showing rays of light moving around. So he's looking around this, and he sees other people in there. As Enrique says, the most impressive spectacle was other two identical men lying down on two extensive comfortable seats on each side of the pilot and against the wall dead persons. The eyes were open and terrified, the ajar mouths, and a little inflated. But why was the third seat empty? This really concerned him. And as he says, I touched it and I verified that it was of a very smooth weaving. The disappearance of the member of the crew 
evidently leaving the door open, began to worry me. Over the box of instruments on board, I noticed a transparent sphere of 25 centimeters in diameter, surrounded by a flat ring inclined to 40 degrees on the horizontal one, and seemed exactly to the planet Saturn, just as is seen in a telescope. So he's describing this floating sphere. It appeared to be rotating. It had a little edge around it, giving it the appearance of Saturn, though it was transparent. This is a really interesting detail because this does turn up in other onboard accounts. And at this point he looks up and he notices a blinking globe of light on the ceiling. And this caused him some concern because he realized that this craft, which he initially thought was not operational, was in fact still operating, at least partly. And he was also quite concerned that there were only three pilots and there were four seats. And with the door open, he was wondering where this fourth figure might be. And he was you know, frightened enough at this point that he decided it was time to get out of there. He looked around the cabin one more time and then exited the craft. And as he stepped out, he slid off the edge and onto the ground. He had an attack of vertigo, he says. And it was only then that he realized that the atmosphere in the craft was quite different from outside. Inside it was heavier and hard to breathe. So he berated himself at this point for not having brought his camera. And he decided that what he was going to do was quickly return to the city where he was staying at a hotel, get a camera, and return to the site with some of his scientific friends. So he gets in his car, and his car just barely starts. He says it was as if the battery had been drained. But even once it started, the engine was sputtering. And it took him a little bit to get the car going, and as he drove off, the engine quickly returned to normal the farther away he moved from the craft. So this is a very interesting electromagnetic effect. So in town, he told his friends, who were all shocked, and at first disbelieving, but they could see that Enrique was very much serious. By this point it was quite late and there was a storm, so they decided to return back to the site early the next morning, which they did. And as Enrique says, we sought the apparatus and we could not find it. The ironic expressions began to be shown in the face of my friends, who, and when called our attention to a pile of ashes approximately two meters of height and five meters of diameter that was found exactly in the place where we had seen the saucer. The ashes had a silver red color. So yeah, his friends are kind of looking at him with surprise to see this huge pile of red ash, which was exactly where this craft had apparently landed. Enrique actually reached down and touched the ashes, as did a few of the others, and they were warm, and they turned the, their hands green, at least for a little while. But one of them looked up into the sky, and this is when they saw UFOs, two of them. One was quite low, and the other was higher up, but they were identical in appearance to the saucer that Enrique had seen on the ground the day before. As Enrique says, one of us raised his eyes to the sky and observed a saucer identical to which I had seen that flew over us at a height reckoned about 600 meters. So that's not very high up. That's about 1,800 feet, quite low. And that's when they looked up and saw another craft. And then looking higher up, they actually saw a third craft, and this third craft was much larger. Larger, It was cigar-shaped, and as they watched, these two craft entered the big cigar-shaped craft, which then took off at thousands of miles per hour. Now, Enrique did have a camera, and so he started snapping pictures of these objects as they're flitting around. He managed to get four pictures. Only two came out. And you can see here a, pic a photograph of the UFO that he took before it went back into this cigar-shaped craft. This is the best photo, apparently, and was published later in a newspaper article. 
So this case does not end here. Immediately following this incident, Enrique developed a pretty severe fever and his skin blistered. He was quite unwell. Here's another interesting fact. He was wearing glasses when he had gone on board this craft and there was a burn mark around his glasses. So his skin was red, he had blisters on his skin and a fever. And this lasted for several weeks. He was quite ill. He was examined by numerous doctors who couldn't determine the cause. They did test him for radiation, but this came out negative. So this was quite a profound experience for him, which he kept secret, only telling uh, one or two people for a long time, but finally did grant an interview for a Venezuelan newspaper, and he later agreed to share his story with crash retrieval expert Leonard Stringfield. And in a, le in a letter to Leonard Stringfield, he described again what happened, I think more succinctly. So although this is a little repetitive, I think he described what happened much better. And I'd just like to quote him directly about this whole experience from beginning to end. It's quite short. As he says, in his own words, the object was resting on the ground in an inclined position. The disc was 32 feet in diameter. The surface was slippery and brilliant. The height was about 13 feet. The tower with windows was 6 feet high, while the interior of the craft was 7 feet high. Three little men were seated in soft armchairs. They were dead. One of the three, the pilot, I believe, was seated in the center of the tower. In front of him was a large panel with bright instruments. His hands were resting on two levers. They were about four feet in height. In appearance, they were human, equal to ourselves, with eyes, nose, and mouth. The color of their hair was gray chestnut, cut short. Their skin was bronze. Their faces were dark. They were dressed in overalls of a gray lead color. There was one chair vacant of the four. I touched the bodies, which were rigid. In the tower, there was a smell of ozone and garlic. In the roof of the cabin, there was an intermittent small light of orangish, whitish color. It was very strange. There were no cables, no pipes, only the panel of the controls. And above the panel, there was a small sphere within a circle. To the right of the pilot, there was an apparatus similar to a TV screen. I remained five minutes in the tower, but the absence of the fourth person impressed me so much that I went out of the machine very stunned. The next day I returned with two engineers, but we found only a pile of ashes, very warm. So yeah, Leonard Stringfield was very much impressed by this report, and he did include it in his book, Situation Red, The UFO Siege. Also, Jim and Cora Lorenzen, they, some years earlier, in 1955, actually August 1955, they published a summary of the case in the APRO Bulletin. So yeah, <laughs> what a case. As you can see, that is a very unusual case of what appears to be a UFO crash. And as unusual as it is, I think it matches up with a lot of other cases involving that same subject, that same area of ufology. It's a case that has always stuck in my mind, so I'm really happy to present it to you today. And here's another case that I think deserves to be well known because it's really unusual. I call this one Examined by Machine-Like Aliens. People report all different kinds of ETs, as we see, and some people do report robotic-like entities. But I can't say I've ever heard anyone describe quite like what this gentleman describes. The witness is Lee Parrish. This case comes from APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. And it's just a really unusual case with psychic phenomena, electromagnetic disturbances, medical effects, multiple witnesses. So I think you'll find it quite interesting. This case occurred in January, on January 27, 1977, in Prospect, Kentucky. 
The main witness is Lee Parrish. He was only 19 years old when this happened, and at the time he worked as a truck driver for his family business, Parrish Supply. And one evening, January 27th, he was driving home from a friend's house, going west on Highway 329. He was about four miles east of US 42, and he was smoking a cigarette, this is an important detail, as we'll see, when he saw a weird object hovering about 100, 150 feet just over the tree line off to the side of the road. He said it looked almost rectangular. It wasn't that big, it was 10 feet high and about 40 feet long, and it glowed so brightly it was hard to look at. It hurt his eyes, but at the same time, he says he felt compelled to watch it. And this was weird to him because he's driving at this time. He doesn't know how he didn't drive right off the road. But about 15 seconds into the sighting, his car radio mysteriously failed. And as he's driving, he suddenly realized this object was directly overhead. He did not see it arrive. It was just suddenly there. It was totally silent. And the next thing he knows, it's immediately accelerating away at very high sp speed. So when he arrived home, he noticed four strange things. Actually, it was his mom who noticed the first strange thing and asked him, what's wrong with your eyes? And this is when he looked in the mirror and he saw that the whites of his eyes were very badly bloodshot and painful. The second strange thing is it was now 1.45 a.m. Lee knows that he had left his friend's house at precisely 1 a.m. because they had just watched a TV program and it had ended. And he lived close to his friend's house. It's only a seven-minute trip. So he was missing 35, 40 minutes of time. The third strange detail they noticed was that the cigarette he was smoking was missing. It was just completely gone. They don't know what happened to it. And the last thing that they noticed, which was a little bit later, that following this encounter, the Jeep that he was driving was malfunctioning badly. The whole electrical system went haywire and needed considerable repair work. So these are all interesting bits of physical evidence. And the case was eventually reported to the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, and Lee Parrish, Parrish after much trepidation, agreed to go under hypnosis to recall the missing time. He was really nervous about it, but at the same time, he really wanted to know what had happened during this missing time. So he was hypnotized by a hypnotist by the name of Lawrence Allison, who worked close with the Lorenzans. And under hypnosis, Lee relived the sighting and it was quite frightening for him. He, he, he was saying over and over again, what is it? And it's not moving. So the light was so bright, it was hurting his eyes, which I think is why we see the red inflamed eyes afterwards. This is one of the most common physiological effects. But then he says he felt, quote, something in his eyes. And the next thing he knew he felt the Jeep itself being pulled up into the air and suspended there. And next, he felt himself pulled from the Jeep through the closed door, and he found himself in a circular white room. It wasn't very large, about 20 feet in diameter with 20-foot high ceilings, but it puzzled him because the UFO that he had seen looked smaller than that, so it looked larger on the inside than it was on the outside another interesting detail. He said it was quite cold inside the craft and the entire room seemed to rock and sway back and forth, much like a boat on the water. It's another interesting detail. So he was standing there, unable to move, and in front of him he saw three, quote, beings that he felt were alive, sentient. But it was odd because they looked very much machine-like. As you can see here in the illustration, one was black, it stood on his left side, and was huge, about as high as the ceiling. He described it as having a flat bottom, one sort of arm, a featureless head, and it seemed kind of rough-skinned. 
and it moved towards him. So this was mobile, and it touched him on his back and left side, causing an uncomfortable sensation of hot and cold, sort of burning and pain. Now there were others. The red figure was on his right. It was about six feet tall, close to his height, also kind of rectangular, and really reminded him of sort of a Coke vending machine. It had one sort of arm. It approached him as well. It was moving, touched him on the shoulder and right temple, right above the ear. He felt a minor stinging sensation. It didn't hurt as much as it did when the black one touched him. And there was another figure, the third one, which was in the center, in front of Lee, also about six feet tall. It had a very blocky structure, sort of a squarish, flat head, no real features. But he said it glowed, and it appeared to have arms, but did not make any movements. And Lee had the distinct impression that this center white figure was in charge. So after the two others had touched him, they moved off, and the white one started to emit this rhythmic scraping sound. And at this point, Lee felt a warmth pass over his body. All three beings moved back and suddenly disappeared. So he was sort of alone there in the room at this point. And he had the distinct impression that the reason he had been taken on board was so that they could check out, quote, his chemical makeup. And he also felt that they were curious about, quote, the way that he was Lee. So he, they, he thought, were interested in his identity. The next thing he knows, he's being floated back into his Jeep, sat down in the chair, and then the Jeep itself floats down to the ground. Now, here's what's really interesting. Investigators learned that at 10.30 p.m., this is about two and a half hours before Lee's encounter, a family who was about four miles distant from the encounter location had also seen a large white disc-shaped object with a dome right outside their home. So there was a whole investigation into all of this, and Lee told investigators that he did have an interest in the subject prior to this encounter, because he had seen UFOs several times before. And on those occasions, he had always been with other people. And he wondered if the fact that he was driving alone on this occasion was a factor as to why he was taken on board. He also said that he had a strong interest in psychic powers and had actually exhibited them on a few occasions. Uh, for example, turning on and off light bulbs by just thinking about it something which was verified by the people around him. Now Lee's mother also said that she had seen and heard actually a UFO hovering very low, very close in their backyard. It was making this loud sort of humming, whirring noise. She ran out and saw it. So this is an important fact because these things do track families. And finally, investigators did more researching and learned that there had been, in fact, a third sighting the day before, only a few miles away from where Lee had had his encounter. So there's quite a bit of corroborating evidence to this very unusual case. I think you'll agree that was a very unusual case. But with all the evidence surrounding it, I think it's absolutely a legit case and just really unusual with the description of these entities that this gentleman saw. I really wonder where he is today. I suspect that he's probably had more experiences given that he's seen UFOs many times, uh, that his mom saw a UFO very close up in the backyard. As we know, this is often, with contactees, a generational phenomenon. So I suspect there's a lot more to that case than is presented here. But yeah, a really unusual case that deserves to be better known. And now we move to the next case, which has some equally bizarre elements to it. And I call this one, I can remember but can't say. I like this case for a number of reasons. The witness was able to converse with the ETs. 
I think it's got some real credence to it because it was investigated by Dr. Leo Sprinkle, who is a scientific researcher, one of the first mainstream scientists to really take a good hard look at the UFO phenomena. As far as I know, the first to actually hypnotize people to remember missing time. And it's a really interesting case in a lot of ways. This case took place on June 20, 1977 in Coeur Idaho. This one involves a woman who wants to remain anonymous. She's been given the pseudonym Rachel Jones. And it was just before midnight on June 20th when she woke up to hear someone coming up the stairs into her apartment. She first thought it might be her friend, but it wasn't because she found herself paralyzed and unable to speak. And it was dark inside, so she couldn't really see who this figure was other than that it was humanoid. And it was wearing a bluish suit. And she felt herself being physically lifted up. And she apparently blacked out because the next thing she knew, she was awake in bed, and it was now about 2 a.m., later than it had been. And uh, she woke up the next morning with a very severe headache. So she kind of just tried to ignore this and push this out of her mind at first, but it was one week later, while flying from Coeur d'Alene to Dallas, Texas, that she looked out the window of the plane, and which was in heavy cloud cover, and she saw two distinct weird flashes of light. And she had a real strong impression that this was the UFO sending her a, quote, kind of greeting. And it wasn't long after her experience in her apartment that she noticed this weird healed scar on the back of her left shoulder. So Leo Sprinkle heard about this case. He agreed to investigate the case and place Rachel under hypnosis. He also inspected this mark on her body. As Leo says in his own words, I saw her in my office and examined the scar on her back near the left shoulder. The scar, or whatever it is, is circular to elliptical in shape with some central radiating lines which form a star-like pattern. The border is well defined. The lesion measures 10 by 8 millimeters and is essentially flat. I don't know what it is. It very definitely is unusual in its appearance and looks like healing secondary to an injury rather than something that would go unnoticed. So Rachel, as it turned out, turned out to be very resistant to hypnosis. And over and over again, she kept saying, I can remember, but can't say. So this is sort of a block that many people experience with their missing time amnesia. But Leo Sprinkle was very skillful with hypnosis and very persistent. And with his guidance, Rachel began to explain what had happened to her. She said that this being came into her room, had an unpleasant sort of ugly appearance. She said he was almost bald, had ears like a little baby, tiny little ears, that his mouth was just a line, and he had no pupils in his eyes, so very dark eyes. And she remembered that he carried her and somehow transported her not far from her home to an area called Fernand's Lake. And it was there that she was taken through a doorway into an enclosure with metallic walls, sort of like brushed aluminum. She said it wasn't super shiny, it was sort of dull, and this is clearly the interior of a craft because she said it was very bright, though she noticed no direct light source. She saw that there were three others in the room, two who looked very much like the figure who took her, and one who looked much more human. She was quite cold until this human-looking figure grabbed her hand, and then she felt much warmer. And she's lying there in this room, and a door opens, and this is when she can hear a humming sound, and what she described as an, quote, upright wheel. It looked metallic. It reminded her of some sort of surgical instrument. And she actually began to walk towards it, but the human-like figure stopped her. 
and he telepathically told her, sit down, please. So she obeyed. She was getting a little bit nervous at this point because this surgical instrument was concerning her. And she began to wonder what the name of this human-looking figure was. And the figure said, Chauvin. She repeated, Chauvar, and he corrected her. He says, no, Chauvin. It's interesting that he provided his name. So Chauvin asked her to take off her shirt. Now, she didn't want to, but Chauvin explained that they only wanted to examine her skin. She was resistant to this. She was kind of upset, but finally she agreed and took off her shirt. And Chauvin was examining her and seemed quite puzzled by her tan lines, apparently not understanding what they were. So she explained what her tan lines were. The next thing she knows, she's finding herself laying on a table on her stomach as a warm light shines down on her back. And this is when she felt a painful burning sensation and she yelled at Chauvin to stop. Now he immediately raised his hand and the pain instantly stopped. But she was pretty mad about it. And uh, she asked him, are you going to let me go home? And uh, he was kind of silent at first, but replied eventually, I didn't mean to harm you. And he told her that they had, quote, made a change that would make her better for others. Uh, they're not sure exactly what that means, but this is sort of your typical examination in many ways. At this point, the three smaller figures entered the room again. She asked this taller human looking figure, will we meet again? And he said yes. And the next thing she knew, she was back in bed. So I don't know if she's had repeat encounters. I, I suspect she has. But it's a pretty interesting case with medical evidence and other weird details. I do think there's a lot more to that case also than we're hearing here. Uh, I wish I knew who the witness was. She is anonymous. Uh, but yeah, I think it has some very interesting things to say about what it's like to be taken on board a UFO. And now we move to the next case, which is super interesting because it does involve multiple witnesses, three witnesses in fact, and some very unusual effects. And I call this one, I Want to Speak with You. I like this case because it began in a very unusual way. Again, it involves three witnesses has some really unusual, what we would call electromagnetic effects, effects on automobiles and machinery and so forth, and just some interesting messages as well. This case took place on September 25, 1980 in Conceso, Brazil. It was around 10.30 p.m. on September 25, 1980, when three men were on a road trip traveling from Belém in northeast Brazil to their home in Rio de Janeiro. The three men were Elias Seixas de Matos, he's a truck driver, Guarasi Fernandes de Sousa, he's a photographer, and Elias's cousin Alberto Seixas Vieira. Now Elias was driving when suddenly the truck headlights began to malfunction blinking on and off by themselves. And at the same time, Elias felt this weird coolness on his neck, almost a liquid coolness, and he heard this voice speaking telepathically in his mind saying, Elias, I want to speak with you. So this kind of freaked him out. <laughs> he told his others that he was going to stop the truck as something very strange was happening to him. And as he stopped the truck, this blue beam shot down from above and struck the hood of the truck. So they stop, they get out of the vehicle, and looking ahead of them on the highway, they can see this fiery red cigar-shaped object. It's quite far ahead of them, about a mile, they estimate. It's right on the road, and it was blinking this powerful white light at them. Now, Alberto, the youngest of them, was quite frightened, but the other two men, they had heard of UFOs. They really were interested in what was happening, 
and wanted to move forward. Alberto begged them not to, but no, the two other guys moved forward. And in fact, Guarassi, who had a camera and was a photographer, did manage to shoot about eight seconds of film, which, according to the researcher who examined the film, shows only this little white light. At this point, they thought of moving forward, but then realizing that they knew about other cases of people being taken on board these craft, they became frightened and decided to retreat back to the truck. And they continued on their journey, but became some concerned when it seemed that their trip was taking far longer than normal. They kept driving and driving, and they just were not arriving at their destination. At this point, of course, the UFO had gone. And when they finally arrived at their next stop, they were shocked to find that it was already 4.30 a.m. And this was about five hours later than they thought it should have taken. So when they go up to fill the truck with gas, Elias was shocked to see that they had used only one liter of gas over a length of 143 kilometers which he estimates would normally have used about 20 liters of gas. So that is very strange. And things became even stranger the next day when they drove from Belo Horizonte to Rio de Janeiro. This was a trip which should have taken about 20 hours, but somehow it took just over half that time, about 12 hours. They could not explain that. And as they arrived at the gentlemen's various homes, other weird effects began to occur. They were dropping Guarasi off at his home, and there was a car parked in front of Guarasi's house, his wife's car. The car headlights began to blink on and off by themselves. <laughs> and when they arrived at Elias's home, the hood of the truck, which they were having problems with, lifted up by itself and then slammed down twice by itself. And there was a third very strange effect. Before this encounter, Elias had a cyst on his hand that had been there for quite some time. Well, now it was gone. This cyst was missing. So they knew something very strange had happened to them. All these weird effects, the missing time of about five hours. So they reported their case which was investigated by a prominent researcher by the name of Irene Granchi. And Dr. Silvio Lago decided that he would, would hypnotize the witnesses. Now, Alberto, he was too frightened. He declined to be hypnotized. He didn't remember most of this trip. But Elias and Guarassi did agree to be hypnotized. So Guar Guarassi was placed under hypnosis but there was some sort of mental block, and the hypnotist just couldn't get any information from him, no matter how hard he tried. So next, Elias was hypnotized. Elias, remember, being the one who had the telepathic message, I want to speak with you. And Elias was a good subject. Under hypnosis, he relived seeing the reddish cigar-shaped object ahead of them on the road, and then he felt a strong spinning sensation and found himself floating head down stuck to the wall of this giant egg-shaped room and it was weird because the strange force kind of slid him down the wall to a small set of steps which led to a circular room where there were tables and he saw a man standing there in the room this man had his back to Elias and was maneuvering multicolored levels on this sort of panel. This man, says Elias, was wearing a tight-fitting, rubber-like yellow uniform with a belt. The room itself was pure white. So Elias approaches this man and says, I'm afraid. What is this? The man didn't reply, and it's at this point that Elias felt his arms become limp, uh, and he was at least partially paralyzed. And as he tried to walk forward, he felt this invisible barrier preventing him from moving any closer to this strange figure. And it was then that this man turned around and looked at Elias, 
and Elias saw that this one was not a human as we would think of it. He was humanoid, certainly. But Elias saw that this man was actually about seven feet tall, very tall, had lilac-colored eyes with no visible pupils, a long nose, a large lipless mouth, and pale skin. So I'd probably say that this was a tall white. Now there was a window, and the man instructed Elias to look out the window, and he saw these very large spheres and a field of stars. So, it's possible these were planets. It's really not stated in the report. But it looks like he's somewhere out there in space. So it's r pretty rare to find a multiple witness onboard UFO case. This one has three. I think that alone makes it worthy of study and attention. And there's always, I mean, there's so many cases like this. These are just six of thousands upon thousands. And the next one I'd like to cover, I find also very interesting. And I call this one, Some Will Believe You, Others Will Not. I find this case interesting for a number of reasons. In some ways, it is your standard onboard experience involving a gentleman who is taken on board and physically examined by ETs. But some of the descriptions of the interior of the UFO are quite unusual. And also the aftermath is very interesting. It's also a very well verified case in that he passed a lie detector test and there was medical evidence and other uh, aspects to the case that I think give it a high level of credibility. This next case occurred on August 7, 1983 in Winifreda, Argentina. And it was around 7.30 p.m. on August 7th when Julio Plattner, who owned a livestock feed store, had just driven up to his employer's farm ranch. And he was opening the gate when his UFO experience began. And I will just let Julio describe his experience in his own words. As Julio says, and I quote, I was suddenly taken aback by an intensely bright light, accompanied by a strange sound. It was as if a lorry were coming towards me. I covered my head with my arms, and after that, I do not remember anything until I awoke inside a room. When I awoke, I found myself lying on an operating table, and I discovered four beings around me. Two were beside me at the top of the table, one clasping my shoulder with his hand. In front of me, about two meters away, there were two more beings, a man and one woman. I moved my lips, asking where I was and what they wanted, but no sound came out. Nevertheless, they seemed to understand me. One of the figures began talking and said telepathically, Don't be afraid. We would not harm you. What you are experiencing now has happened to thousands of people before. You can reveal it if you wish. Some will believe you and others will not. So looking around him, Julio inspected the room. He saw it had kind of cushiony walls. That was his impression. They were beige in color. He saw no doors or windows. The room was pretty small. It was round in shape, about nine feet across. And at this point, he did notice that he was wearing no clothes. He tried to sit up, but felt as though he was being held down by an invisible force. Uh, nevertheless, he felt no fear. As he says, I felt very calm and comfortable. The temperature inside was quite pleasant. I was not afraid. I looked around and gathered as many details as possible. Once, the woman came close to me and put her hand on my wrist but I did not feel it. Then they put a strange artifact on my left arm with some kind of tube, about 30 centimeters long, half rigid, half flexible, and they took some blood. They didn't use any rubber band or needle, but I could see how my blood raised inside the tube up to the middle when they stopped. I tried to touch the being at my back, but I struck something like glass. I tried to stand up, and my forehead struck another glass. 
It was as if I were inside a glass cube. Now Julio says that these beings looked humanoid. They were about five feet tall, hairless, with short noses, a small mouth, and small ears flattened against the head. He says their eyes were their strangest feature because they were very much circular and bulging. Each of them wore skin-tight gray-white uniforms and they acted very business-like. They weren't really emotional. Just getting a job done. And after the exam, Julio was instructed to stand up. And when he did, he got a shock because he does not remember his clothes being put back on him, but he was now fully dressed and even his watch was back on his wrist. There was a sudden flash of light and he found himself sitting back in his van now and looking around, this is very weird, he saw that he was eight miles away from where he had just been taken. So this case was examined thoroughly and in fact afterwards Julio was examined by his physician, Dr. Adolf Pizarro, who you can see here. And the doctor said, and I quote, in my professional opinion, there was an extraction of blood or some material. I have treated him for six years, and I can declare that Platner has always been calm, sound, and sane. He's well-respected and an ideal citizen. I have to give kudos to that witness, Julio Platner for having the courage to step forward, allow his own name to be used, and really tell everyone that this is what he experienced. And I think given the fact that he is well respected in his community and has other witnesses who corroborate his sincerity and honesty, and there's a lot of reasons to believe that everything he says actually happened. It's a great case. And here's the last case that I'd like to present and this one has got a number of really <laughs> fascinating elements to it and I call this one we only want to show you something and I love this case because it started out with the witness being quite frightened but as soon as he actually met the ETs face to face and started to talk to them his fear evaporated he found the whole experience quite benevolent and really interesting and the things he was sh shown and told are just super fascinating. That's why I really wanted to include it in this compilation. This case took place in July of 1988 in Betances, Puerto Rico. The main witness is Carlos Manuel Mercado. It was a hot July evening and Carlos was unable to sleep because of the heat. So he got out of bed, he was sleeping with his wife in the bedroom, and went into the living room, which he thought might be a little cooler. So he's reclining on the couch, and after a few minutes, he noticed this white light outside and heard a strange humming noise. He didn't think much of it until he heard a tapping sound on the metal shutters which were covering his windows. So he gets up and opens the shutters, and this is when he got an incredible shock. As Carlos says in his own words, there they were, three little fellows standing there under the window. It shook me because they were so different. They looked a bit like us, but they weren't human. They were little chaps, as I say, and ugly, with heads a bit bigger than ours and no hair. They had no ears, and their eyes were huge, dark. I could see no noses on them, just little holes, and a little slash for a mouth. Their faces looked flattened. Their skin was sort of grayish, and their faces and hands were covered with little bumps or lumps. You know how acne looks? Well, it was like that. They were ugly. They were about three to four feet tall, they were thin and dressed in overalls like mechanics wear from top to toe and of a sort of grayish creamy looking color, a sort of sandy shade. Only their heads and hands were not covered by clothing. So he first felt a considerable fear seeing that these guys looked so different. But it was then that these apparent ETs began to talk to him telepathically 
And they said, Do not be afraid. We're not going to hurt you and only want to show you something. At this point, all of Carlos's fear completely evaporated and he had a very strong impression that these beings were very good people with good intentions and meant him no harm whatsoever. And as Carlos says, they asked me to come out, so I opened the door and I went out. Then two of them took a hold of me, one on each arm, and took me out up the road. And it was then that I saw the machine. It was one of those saucers of theirs. It was standing there on the ground besides the Highway 101, right on the corner opposite my house. So he describes this craft, as you can see here. The craft was round with a cupola on top. The cupola had windows that were all lit up. The rim of the craft was lined with a rainbow, he says, of colored lights. The craft itself stood on four legs. A ladder extended below it, and the beings instructed Carlos to climb inside, which he did. And inside, Carlos saw weird machinery, panels with controls and little lights. He saw other short beings there working on the panels. And there was also another being inside who was much taller and looked very much more human. He did have gray skin, but it was smooth. He had a large head and dark eyes. Uh, but yeah, much taller, and he was dressed in sort of a robe or tunic. So at this point, Carlos heard a loud, a loud hum. He could hear the landing legs retracting. And looking out the portholes, he saw that the craft was in fact rising up. And to his surprise, the craft began moving towards the Sierra Bermeja Mountains, specifically to one mountain uh, called the Monte El Cayul. So he was shocked to see this craft with him in it <laughs> heading directly towards the mountain. And he was scared it was going to crash right into it when suddenly the mountain seemed to open up. A tunnel appeared and this craft went inside the mountain to a very large cavern inside. It was huge. And the craft lands, and he gets out, and he can see all these other craft there. And as Carlos says, the tall being told me to come out with him, and he made me put on a sort of big, enormous, dark spectacles so that I could see everything down there clearly. It was all very well lit down there. You couldn't see where the light was coming from, but it was very brilliant light, very white. All the walls there were covered, with a very shiny silver metal. So this huge cavern was filled with short little ETs, very much like the first ones he saw. I think probably we would call them greys. But this taller gray explained to Carlos that they've been there for a very long time and they want to stay there. They told Carlos that he was contacted because they wanted him to tell others that they have no bad intentions. They have no desire whatsoever to harm humans or conquer humans or anything like that. The being said that ultimately they would like to interrelate with humans, but that it was our authorities who were causing the problems with this, that our authorities don't want that. So Carlos protested to him, to them, that he was just an ordinary guy <laughs> and nobody important, and why were they telling him? But the E.T. said that that didn't matter, that they had taken many people down there and given them the same message. And that was the gist of the whole encounter. It was quite short. Carlos was then taken back into the same craft, which left the cavern the same way it had come in, through what appeared to be a tunnel. He said it was amazing because the mountain just opened up and then closed back up, and there were trees and rocks and bushes and you just could not tell where he had entered or exited this mountain. And it quickly landed back to the exact location where he had been taken. They escorted him out of the craft back into his house and told him that one day they would return. And they left. And as Carlos says, it was after they had gone that I began to get nervous. 
This thing, which I have told nobody, happened to me. It left me too shaken. It wasn't something bad, but had a profound effect on me. I'm still waiting for them because I like what happened. In my opinion, they aren't bad. I could feel it. If they had wanted to do me harm, they could have done it when they took me. I'd like them to come back so that I could go with them again. They aren't bad people. So he was very vehement about that because at the time there was a lot of press coverage about UFOs. And his, he says his experience was absolutely benevolent. So there you go. Those are the six cases I wanted to present today. Six cases of people being taken on board, or in the first case, going on board himself. <laughs> uh, really interesting cases, and I think you'll agree they do have a lot more information than a simple sighting or even a face-to-face -face encounter. People get to see what it's like inside a UFO, and as you can see, there are amazing similarities and some really interesting differences as well. I think it's very interesting that in the vast majority of these cases we do see humanoid ETs, though that one case with the machine-like ETs, that's off the charts, an outlier. I've never heard anything quite like it. But again, these cases do have a lot to tell us about the ETs. These are my favorite cases, as you probably know because I've written books about these. One's called Inside UFOs, another's called Onboard UFO Encounters, and several others like Wondrous and of course Symmetry, all of which are all about onboard UFO encounters. So I hope you've learned something today. I hope you found this interesting. And I really want to thank you for watching. I truly appreciate it. And like I always like to say, keep searching for answers. Keep looking for the truth. And most important, keep having fun. Till next time, bye.